All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mike Klein. I'm a director with Liberty Mutual's uh, Big Data and Analytics Group, and Yi Ching. My name is Yi Ching Wang. I'm an IT architect for Liberty Mutual Insurance and work for Mike department. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're here today to talk to you about our Hadoop journey, uh, kind of what, we, what we've done with Hadoop on-premise. And you know, our, our fancy tagline, right, is one small Hadoop footprint, but one giant leap to understanding. And hopefully you'll see through, that, through this presentation what we mean by that. Um, I'm going to start, like, we have some North Stars in the group, some things that we're striving for. Um, and these are, you know, you look at these, they're not necessarily technical, but they're critically important. Uh, we're trying to empower Liberty Mutual to le leverage the vast data and talent. Talent's a huge part. Well, we have many, many smart people and, and buckets of data, but it's connecting those two things together in a way that uh, is meaningful. We're trying to make analytics easy. Um, you'll see later on in the slide, right, analytics is not easy. Uh, it's not something that's super simple. It's getting better each day, uh, but it is, it is still difficult. And we want data to be free and secure, right? Oftentimes, the, you kind of see this dichotomy. It's like everybody wants the data to be everywhere, but it also has to be secure, and there's like this tension between the two. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're trying to foster a, a culture of quick experimentation, essentially the agile practices, right? So encouraging people to experiment and fail, uh, and then pick up from that failure and try again. And then for all intents and purposes, we're trying to erase the line between business and IT. Right? So you'll hear me talk about that. Uh, well, you'll hear me talk about the business and IT. I'm doing it really for, just for a frame of reference, but really we're trying to erase, erase that. You know, our, our CIO has a tagline that, uh, you know, he says, hey, we happen to be an IT company that sells insurance. Uh, rather than an insurance company that has, has IT. Right. So just a little bit about Liberty Mutual, where uh, last week we were ranked the 75th uh, company out of the Fortune 100. You know, we have over $37 billion of revenue on an annual basis. We have about 55,000 employees in the United States, uh, more internationally, right, ac spread across five different continents. And we have about 5,000 IT professionals that help support that organization. So today we're going to kind of go through this journey about how we think about analytics, how we work as a team, um, who, what are these data scientists that everybody talks about, and how does, how does the data lake, and then Yi Ching is going to take us how the data lake that we built on premise uh, takes us, how it's helped us. Um, our data lake that we're talking about today is on premise. We are moving to the cloud. There's no doubt we're moving to the cloud, but we found that uh, having a, a beachhead on premise, it really helped our organization move faster. Uh, so we'll talk about that. All right, when we talk about analytics, I mean, I, I thought it might be useful just to define what we mean by analytics, because a lot of times people just say those words, and uh, you, you know, don't really, it means different things to different people. So when we talk about analytics with our business partners, we talk about getting the data, landing the data, and then studying the data. So getting the data you know, from all the different sources that are out there, which are, are numerous and growing, um, landing the data, and, and by the way, this is true for big data and other types of data, right? So landing the data, be it in SQL, Oracle, Teradata, you name it, and then studying the data. You know, typically we use SAS in the, in the previous years. Now we're moving more and more towards R and Spark and Python and those type of languages and libraries. The last little bit that isn't on here is get, land, study, and then share, right? So at the end, once you have these insights, you need to be able to communicate them effectively to your business partners and to the business as a whole through either a BI tool or R Shiny or you know, numerous different ways. So what about the data scientists? So, and you guys probably have seen this slide or something similar to it, right? A data scientist or a true data scientist by like definitions from years past is a PhD credentialed person that has, you know, business knowledge, mathematics, statistics background, and an engineering mindset, right? Extremely rare to have all three of those and to be really effective. Um, what we're trying to do in our group, Yi Ching and I, we're trying to build data science teams, essentially, right? So a group of energized engineers, and that's important, right? Not just people that are like kind of interested in this stuff, like really passionate about data analytics. So they're software developers, they're data engineers, they're you know, analysts, and there are some PhD data scientists, right? But you don't have to, this is my belief, right? You don't have to be a PhD to be a data scientist, right? I mean, there's tons of value that somebody can deliver to the organization and not have uh, you know, that, that level of credentials. So when we went out and talked to our business partners, you know, that's largely who my customer is, right? My customer are other groups inside of that large organization that we described before. Um, <clears throat> you know, we found analytics is hard, right? 
uh, no surprise there, right? So many, many suppliers and vendors will tell you, you know, hey, it's so much easier, you know, just buy these tools. But the tools are still hard, and they do require some special skills and knowledge of those skills, especially in the Hadoop, infra the Hadoop ecosystem, right? It is this jigsaw puzzle of things you have to put together sometimes. And it is getting better and better through the years, right? I mean, the tools are getting more and more mature, but they do require some specific skills. Um, the security and analytics have competing goals, right? So what I mean by that, and I don't know if you guys have found this in your organization, but oftentimes security says, you know, you can't have anything unless you explicitly tell me why you need it, right? And then you have the data analytics folks or the data scientists saying, give me everything because I'm not sure what I'm asking for yet, right? And there's this tension between the two. Like they both, they both are kind of right, but they are at conflicting odds and they have different goals and objectives. So we have to figure out a way to break that down so it's not this constant tug of war. And we'll talk about uh, how we did that. And then last but not least, I hit on it before, is the IT business collaboration. Like folks need to, um, you know, they're, like I said, we're trying to erase those lines. Like there are data scientists that are in IT, right? There are developers that are in the business. Like there is not this, uh, you know, everybody who's technical is in IT. Like those, especially in this data science realm, you know, we do have data scientists or analysts that code, right? And R and Python and all these other types of things. And we need to figure out a way to better collaborate together and not have these rigid um, silos, for the lack of a better term. So where do some of these, some of these frustrations come from? Where, wh you know, why is analytics so hard? Um, you know, this is kind of the classic picture, if you will. Like, you know, you have all these source systems, uh, you know, on, I don't know what side it is for you, but it's on my right. Um, and you know, there, and even the source system is actually even further upstream, right? This is just the, rational, the relational databases that it lands in. Then they can put it into marts and warehouses. Some of the lines go all the way to the BI tools that are using it. Other times, you know, they're aggregated together in a warehouse. There's this hard separation at the bottom there between IT and the business. Then you have these data scientists that are kind of left with, you know, a bunch of questions. I mean, their access to the data is you know, if they're lucky, uh, direct SQL query to the database, but largely it's gonna be through one of these BI tools, right? And they're left with questions like, you know, well, one, why did it take so long <laughs> to get the data that I, I'm looking for, right? And it took so long because it's like, well, who do I talk to? What department is that in? You know, what database is that in? All those types of questions. Um, you know, what did the original data look like, right? So as it goes through this, the distance from the original source system to the analyst is a long journey, and there's a lot of assum assumptions baked into that journey for right reasons at each stage, but at the end, it, it's kind of like the game of telephone, right? What comes out the other end, you know, it's kind of like the thing that went in it in, in the beginning, but it's not exactly the same, right? So how can we, um, you know, get the analyst to see that direct data, that original data source? Who do I talk to? Where do I go? Um, you know, I can't call the help desk and say, hey, help me get to a, a petabyte data source, right? I mean, I need to have connections between the, and we have those, right? We have those connections between the IT teams and the business partners, um, but they need to just be strengthened, right? And much more of a partnership uh, together. And then is there more data that I can't see, right? So there's these things that are produced through the different BI tools, but what about all this other data? Is that everything? Or is there other data that is important to me that, uh, that you might, you know, that again, through that assumption chain, people not, might not understand that it is important. And what about tools that are emerging? Um, you know, R, Spark, you know, H2O, all these different things that are not, um, you know, not part of our legacy install base, if you will. They're things that, I mean, they are now installed at, at Liberty Mutual, but what if something else comes out tomorrow, which is very likely, right? Something else will come out and people want to be able to use it very quickly. How do I hook up the data scientist to that data, make the data free and secure it with something that uh, just came out yesterday, right? That's the challenge before us. And then of course, what about open source? Like a lot of these tools are, you know, all of the examples here are packaged products that are vendor support, yet I wanna use Spark, I wanna use, you know, the Hadoop ecosystem, I wanna use Pig, et cetera, right? How, how does support work in that environment? So they're left with lots of questions, some of which they, they actually want answers to, and honestly, some, some of the questions, they don't, they just want us, to, us in IT to deal with it, right? They don't actually want to know all those answers. They want to know about the data, but they don't want to be concerned about all the other different pieces. What we're trying to evolve it into, and again, this is a journey, is 
what we did, and, and Yiching will go into the details of it, but is we built this Hadoop data lake uh, built on HTTP. It's small, more like a data puddle than anything else. Um, it's only eight nodes, right, so very small. Um, but it allowed us to really crack some insights that, uh, that our business didn't know before. <clears throat> so we took the data from the, from the source systems and we dropped it on the lake. Now, some might ask, doesn't that create a copy of the data in two different places? It does. Is it ideal? No. But is it good enough to get started and to make those data scientists happier and, and to eliminate the cost of delay of trying to figure out you know, what is the right solution, the perfect solution? So we also took uh, unstructured data and data sources that were non-traditional in the past right, and started dumping them onto the lake, leveraging Spark and Hadoop. You'll notice that the arrows kind of turned around in that, uh, in that study phase. You know, so now it's Python, R, SAS, you know, H2O, et cetera, now interrogating that same data source from, from many different tools. Right? And if something does come out tomorrow you know, in a secure fashion, we should be able to spin up another, another engine and just interrogate that, there, that data. At the bottom, you notice that that wall's gone. So removing that wall between business and IT, especially as you go more and more from one side to the other, and the, the data scientists can iterate and learn, and they are getting comfortable with, uh, with you know, failure as well, right? Recognizing that it's an iterative process. Nothing's going to be perfect in the beginning. Uh, they're getting more and more familiar with the software development lifecycle, right? Checking in models as code. Like, those are not things that they were used to. Those are things that IT is bringing to them, um, and, you know, and they're growing from that. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we did is we formed one team. So what this is is a mix of data scientists, like business side data scientists, with IT data scientists, engineers, and developers. So we got together and we said, okay, let's tackle a problem. Be it text analytics, be it streaming analytics, predictive analytics, you know, you pick it. Um, and let's get together as one team, like really no barriers between the two, and tackle the problem. So we formed one squad, is what we called it. You know, we operate in an agile fashion, and we just tackle the problem and we just work it until we get to the end of the sprint and then we figure out, you know, how do we do? Did we, did we make some progress on this? Yes or no? Um, I think the key message here is that they, it is really one team, right? So if people, if, if there's this question of, oh, who do I talk, you know, if the data scientist on the business side says, hey, is this all the data? Either our folks directly can answer that or they know exactly who to go to to talk to, right? There's not these long lines of chains uh, of communication that have to happen. Um, you know, we found that even though there's a lot of data science happening in IT, and there's a lot of IT, as I mentioned, happening in the business, right? So having those two groups together, uh, they're able to learn quickly from each other. Um, so now Yi Ching is gonna start to talk a little bit about uh, some of the different experiences that we had on the lake. Um, a key message through his whole presentation is kind of, you know, recognize that this is the same lake. And again, Liberty Mutual is a large organization. We have, we have many, we have different lakes for different business units and whatnot. But the lake that we're describing here, we're all used on the same eight nodes, right? Which is important because it's a lot of value out of a small, small unit. Thank you, Mike. Yep. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we build the data lake and uh, our use case in the data lake. Um, in our day lake, we have uh, two clusters, one for production, one for test environment. Um, each cluster has uh, three master nodes and uh, five data nodes. Um, each data node has a uh, 256 gigabyte memory and uh, 20 core CPU, <coughs> 24 gigabyte local hard disk drive. So the total space is 120 gig, um, terabytes data. Um, even this is a, like a, we can handle hundreds of terabytes data from big data perspective, this is a, still considered a small cluster. From software perspective, we install most of our uh, Horton work uh, ecosystem components. Um, we, the circle we put here has a top use cases. User, from end user perspective, they use Zeppelin and MRV views to connect to a server, run the ad hoc query or like, um, and data science programming using R or Python. Data loading with a scoop. Um, use P utilize a lot of pig hive MapReduce 
and Spark, we have to, you have a heavy duty Spark workload. We use Spark to run not only machine learning, we also utilize Spark SQL to do the ETL star style work. So we can ingest the data, load data in the HDFS, and do the, use Spark SQL to do the transformation. Security perspective, we have a ranger uh, for the data authorization. We have uh, locks for the perimeter security and the HDFS data encryption. From an enterprise perspective, the most painful thing is uh, security. So, <laughs> so you everybody know how hard is the security, right? So in the big data environment, we must build highly secured and multi-tenancy cl data lake cluster. Without proper security implementation, even we have a lot of fancy functions and functionalities, we couldn't even use the data lake. So nobody want to use without a security neighbor. When we talk about security, we always talk about big three things, which is uh, data encryption, user authentication, and the data authorization. Um, we, we have a centralized AD server. So user will have the AD uh, credential created in the AD and we have a different AD group for each project. From in the data lake, we have a different edge node. We can host the Ambari server running Spark, Shiffer server, and running Zeppelin th through the Linux server. All these applications, we enable the Kerberos authentication, use, a, use a AD and key distribution, use AD server as a key Kerberos distribution center. Uh, in the data lake, we have the, um, uh, because not o the data lake is not only for one project, one application, we have a lot of sensitive data over there. For example, we have a legal application, we have a HR, we have a finance application. Each application group, they don't want to access the other people's data. We enable the, the um, security room in the HDFS, so data stored in the Hadoop data lake must be encrypted. From application level, we have a ranger policy plugging to the Hive HDFS protect the data uh, from application level, right? So, but not, we not only stop right here, we, if a user use command line, SSG log into a system, they can skip the range of policy. So from OS perspective, we have to put HDF ACL to protect data. We use Scoop to load the data from different kinds of database to the data lake. Yeah, the Scoop security depends on the different data sources you, we are working on. You can, we can enable Kerberos, we can, um, put a SSL in the connection string or put a, the encryption you could chew on the different databases. We have a different alternatives working over there. Once we build the environment up running, so we must allow people to access easily. So we can run into different kinds of challenges and the user want to use BI analytical tool to access a data lake to do ad hoc query and they also want to integrate the different software tools or to store the data, historical data in, in the environment and do the data streaming. So once we build security correctly, everything looks like uh, should be easy. <laughs> but actually, before security implementation, everything works fine. After we enable security, everything breaks to pieces, right? So you, you know that. <laughs> so. The, we have to reconfig the Kerberos configuration, for example, for the different uh, component plugin, we have to enable Kerberos. Security not working just one thing, they all work com together. So we have to use combined security mechanism, 
for example, we talk about ranger policy is not enough. We have to use HDF, HDF ACL to protect the raw data. Also, when we hook in the BI client tools, we deal with different kind of BI software, like Microsoft BI, Power BI, and Tableau, Cognos, or data virtualization tool, like a DB Visualizer. So different tools have a different connection mechanism. So not a, because our data lake is a Kerberos enabled, not every tool support Kerberos. Like Tableau, they support the uh, Hive Kerberos integration, but they don't have a building driver for Spark. Power BI, they don't have a Spark authentication, but they give you the generic ODBC driver you can install in your local um, client-side environment to enable Kerberos. So it depends on which tool you use, you have to figure out what alternative. We use a lot on Spark. We use a lot of Spark for you know, machine learning, that kind of functionality. Spark security. Actually, Spark has no security at all. <laughs> it, and because we enable Kerberos, we use Kerberos for authentication. When we t run the Spark Threadless server, the client uses Kerberos ticket sign authenticate to the Spark Shiffer server. To protect the data, we have an AD group provisioned in our data lake, so we can choose uh, which AD group we want. When we configure an environment, we have a lot of AD groups. For each project, we set up AD group so we can provision in the uh, data lake server. S user can use the same inter enterprise credential login to the environment. In the recent release, um, Hortonwork has a LLAP bundled with Hive and the Spark. They, they just come out like um, um, uh, HDP 2.6 has um, announced of Hive LLAP uh, integration, which is GA. 2.61, 2.62 2 is going to be have um, Spark LLAP enabled. So you, not just only for the Kerberos, we use Kerberos authentication, we use AD group, HDF, ACL, then we can still use Ranger, Spark SQL, and RAP combined technology for the data author, for the row level security and the column level security. Once we figure out security, so other use cases should be simple. From business perspective, they want to hook in the BI tool to the data lake. Um, this is a very typical use case. Um, Power BI as a front end tool, they want to access the data loading the data lake. We have a lot of billing data in cloud. We have uh, AWS, we have Azure, we use a Power BI Cloud Foundry. We integrate these billing data in the Hadoop data lake. So uh, let's talk about like a, what is the old way, right? So if we want to build an enterprise reporting in the old fashion, like a uh, re related by using relational database, the first thing the IT going to ask a business analyst, what is your data table DDR? Tell me what's your schema. Tell me what do you want to do. So how to give me the report requirements so we can figure out design the table DDR for you. Then we figure out the transformation. How do we load the data? Put into the relational database. Then you can hook in, develop the enterprise reporting, hook in the BI tools for, to build the report. So by using Hortonwork Data Lake, we can simply just land the data in the Hadoop. So the ETL developer we put here doesn't necessarily have to be the IT developer. The business user can use whatever tools we provide to them to look at the data immediately. Then quickly figure out, oh, this is the model I want to build. Then build a hive table on top of it, do the transformation by using Spark SQL. Then doesn't like the result, just the 
drop the external table, then create another set of a schema, do it from scratch. So, so this kind of inter iteration quickly del deliver the report output to the end users. Yeah, we also not just only we quick development from performance perspective, the Spark SQL is a, like a like a 10 times, I would say 10 times faster than a traditional database. Depends on how much volume you, you build with, deal with, right? From the uh, connectivity perspective, we use uh, um, o uh, Spark ODBC driver. We install driver, if your user use Power BI desktop, install driver in their desktop. If we, uh, from the, in, to deploy the model, we have a Power BI gateway server. We can access the data on-prem. So um, Microsoft does have a built-in driver for Spark on-prem. So we have to like uh, load the Hortonwork Spark, Spark driver, put into the client's server environment, and then configure the Kerberos. That's, a, that's the only limitation we have. So we could probably next release on Power BI, they can figure out the, what is the right Spark driver for the data on-prem. Um, this is another typical um, use case. We, this happened on the same data lake. It, in our data lake, you, not only you can use existing components, you can also add in your other open sources, like Elasticsearch. We have a business case, so I want to load the Experian data, which is, uh, has an um, enterprise quitting score. I want to provide the business name, street address, then um, zip code, city, and state. The, the, his, the, the data includes historical information. The name could be changed. So the business wants to do the fuzzy match not exactly string comparison. So, so the, the traditional SQL Oracle database won't be able to do that. Even when we use Spark or Hive, you have to do the table scan. Because I give you address, tell me what's all the 500 attributes in that data set. You, you, and also this is a fuzzy match. You have to scan the entire database, right? So to solve the problem, we utilize Spark and the like search combination. Elect search has a, uh, has a Hadoop plugin. We, you can hook in to the Spark and then you write a very simple Spark Scala code to write the data, from, read the data from, HDF, from HDFS and write into the Elect search. You see this um, little box on the right here is um, it's just the Spark submit command line. It's ten, I, um, it's running this uh, master mode, young mode, it's running a full executor. Each t executor take a one gigabyte memory and read um, experience data. Experience send us um, about um, a 100 gigabyte data every quarter. So include a couple of years of historical data, the, the entire data size could be terabytes. So scan the terabytes, we want to what is the performance we, we want to pursue? So SQL Server, Oracle database, to the table scan, fuzzy match. Couple minutes, probably the best, right? So, so if you would like, like a, take a look. So the, the code to write Spark real data, write to in the like search is just extremely simple. Three lines code actually, read the data, then combine the data together, then save it to the Elixir search. So any developer can do that. So, so this is this is using um, it's doing the ETL. For ETL, you. yeah, it's just to save it to the Elixir search to use Spark. Spark is so fast. We uh, depends on how many uh, nodes you install the Elixir search. We have to like uh, slow down Spark a little bit to in order to write the data. So the search other couldn't handle this. Once the data right into the search, we can run this kind of uh, REST, kind, REST API call to do the fuzzy match. 
the performance against 100 gigabyte data is a sub-second, which I'm totally surprised. And you see the how simple this solution is. You have a terabyte data, is loaded into the data lake, then you use three line Scala code, right to elect a search. Then you ha can r write your REST API to do the fuzzy match right here. So like city, fuzzy match, name equal E chain, then you go to reply the 500 columns of the entire data set. And the performance is in the sub second. So that this is a little bit of magic. I <laughs> like them very much. <laughs> Um, another use case um, we have here is for data archive. Why we build this data lake? Is data lake is to store data. We have a machine logs, we have a SharePoint log, different logs, syslog server. We turn on the Apache Flume, we can stream your data into the Hadoop, right to SDSS. Also, we can use uh, Hortonworks data flow, which is all NiFi to build the UI-based um, workflow process. We have a Spark, we have, uh, we have a Splunk running, using by existing environment, which is doing like real-time security metric monitoring for the hot data. For like a tons of uh, security log, warm data, we saving HDFS. HD, um, Hadoop Data Lake can, have an API talk to Splunk, Splunk can pull the data, running MapReduce, get it, do the, another kind of uh, analytical analysis. Knife, um, I like uh, knife, use Knifei to build the uh, workflow because it gives you like a one-stop shop. You have a centralized UI environment. You can, you have provide different multiple interfaces. Um, in this, this example, we, have a SharePoint log right to the Kafka um, streaming. Then NiFi read from Kafka, the merge the log file to the big log file. Depends on, we want like a, every log file, we want one, we don't want a miscellaneous log file right to the SDFS. We want to set up the threshold when the log file size hits one gigabyte right to the SDFS. So, you see this is a uh, sample uh, data flow diagram. Uh, different Kafka string as an input data source, the merge content, then hitting to the one gigabyte data file size run right to SGFS. It's very simple use case. Once we build the data lake environment cluster, after we build security correctly, the use case should be simple and powerful. So um, that's my um, presentation. I'm going to hand over to Mike to wrap up this. Yeah, so back to those North Stars, right? Um, this one, yeah. Um, those North Stars, it, it's, we want to make it easy, but it's not, right? Analytics is difficult. There's a lot of different uh, levers to pull. A lot of what Yi Ching went through, we we're talking about that on our on premise data lake. I described that, right? That's probably the easiest, uh, if you will, right? It only gets tougher moving to the cloud, and that absolutely is the direction we're going. But those security challenges Yi Ching went through and some of the other ones, like those don't go away. They're just now up in the cloud and there's other new, new concerns that kind of come up, right? So we found that, uh, that just, you know, just getting started was kind of one of the, the main objectives, right? You know, I got enough funding together for a small eight node cluster non-production and that's what we ran on for like the first, uh, you know, six months or so while we figured out some of these tweaks and stuff. Then we went back and got production and we started to form that team and show real, real value. Um, don't be afraid to fail, right? So we definitely went down some of the, the paths that Yiching talked about. It's like, oh, especially in the security realm, right? Will Power BI work with this uh, Spark driver? No, right? It won't work that way. Well, it will, but you have to suck all, you know, billion rows into it in order for it to work, right? That's not a viable solution. Um, there was many different things that we went through and we kind of scraped our knees as we were figuring out um, the best way to lay out Hadoop. Um, invite your, your quote unquote business partners. Again, we're racing those lines, but I'm gonna call them business partners into the process, right? Make them part of your team. So when, you're, when 
we were working through that Experian data set, and they said, oh, wow, this is great. Can you do, can you, uh, you know, we need the performance to be less than a second. Yi Ching was like, all right, let's try it. We tried it with Tez. We tried it with a whole bunch of different yeah. scenarios. And then we tried it with Elasticsearch, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. This is what we were looking for. But that iterative cycle probably took, um, you know, maybe two weeks, two, maybe three weeks. You know, yeah. once we got the data there, I mean, there was some movement there. Uh, but to, to rapidly prototype and let them be part of it. And they get really excited, so generating some exci excitement about it. So last but not least, the, you know, a small lake is, is still very beneficial, right? You can learn a lot. You can derive a lot of value. Um, out of, you know, both for your own learning as you grow a team, but also, you know, real business value. Uh, we use the lake, you know, Yi Ching mentioned, you know, we use it for storage, but we also use it for a lot of machine learning models. We use it for ETL of, of transforming the data in that experience example from one data set to another data set. Um, we found it to be, you know, extremely valuable to have, to have the environment. So that, uh, that's what we have. So uh, any questions or anything that we can uh, answer? Yeah. Yeah, data is in storing is in storing SDFS, right? So we have a Hive schema on top of it, and both Hive and the Spark engine can read the data. So we choose Spark because from performance perspective. Yeah, yeah. we use Spark SQL. Depends on different kind of SQL. Sometimes. Hive may run, Hive tests may run faster than Spark, depends on. So for example, you want to retrieve a subset of a data. You provide a key, I want to retrieve a sub, very small subset of a data. You need to go through this table scan. The Hive test going to run very stable. Uh, Spark, SQL, put everything into memory. If you don't do the aggregation, um, it could be slow. Um, Spark is more uh, faster when you run machine learning kind of SQL, you do the aggregation with right format, like a parquet. Like a Hive run faster with Org. Oh, right. Could you share the same concept of Hive than Tez than Spark? Yeah. Yeah, we a lot. We, uh, a lot we did a lot. Yeah. Spark SQL is the best. Yeah. So like a Spark with a parquet is a buddy, and the Hive Org is like a, is a perfect marriage. Parquet or Org? I'm sorry? Parquet or Org? Parquet. Spark with Parquet. Yeah. Spark is trying, um, Databricks were working on the, um, different Spark, uh, different uh, data readers. They, they handle Parquet faster today, so they are working on the faster reader to handle the ORC now. Other questions? Yep. How are you handling the schema changes when it comes from the processing to the data lake? Yeah, so the schema changes as it comes from the source system to the data yes. lake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, sch schema may change or may not. So in most of the case, we use scoop to import data. So I don't need to specify what's a schema in the data lake. I just use scoop to read the data. When data write to the Hadoop, it's generally the exact same schema as the source system. You can also change your schema if you want, but you probably have a very good reason to why you want to use a different schema. So I think the first step is make it simple, read the data, just do exactly load data, put into Hadoop. What I was looking at is when you try to, say if I do in version one, I have like 10 columns, and down the lane, now the, the table metadata has changed. So now you're trying to import the same data because now that's going to affect all of it downstream application, so how are you managing it? So do you have some kind of metadata layer where you're trying to capture all this metadata and uh, try to work with those things? Or? The, um, you, you, that's not gonna be easy, right? <laughs> so because you read the data, today I read the 10 columns, tomorrow I read the same table from a relation data, but it changes 20 columns. You, it, it's not going to be fitting the same schema. You have yeah. to create a separate table. And, and I think that's the question, how we deal yeah. with that, right? So, I mean, some of it, we're just not old enough to experience some of that, right? So, I mean, we recognize that that, that issue is there. Actually, I see some of my Liberty colleagues in the, in the audience here. They definitely have experienced that. Uh, Jeff's shaking his head, right? As the schema changes, 
And Jeff, I think you did write a meta layer on top of it, if I remember it correctly. Right? Hard to see something about encryption of the data from the HDFS. So you're using encrypting the whole directory where you're trying to store the data. Is that what you're trying yeah. to mean there? Yeah, yeah. HDF support um, um, encryption zone. So basically, you just type whatever key you can encrypt is the entire directory or a folder, whatever you name it, right? So it's client side encryption. So when you use the user from whatever client tool, Hadoop X systems access data, the the, the not data is not uh, encrypted at a rest. Data also encrypted in transit. I see. Are you handling any data association or PI data, or do you do any of those column encryptions or something like that? So uh, uh, obfuscating and PPI data is that what yeah. you're um, So not today. Not not in what we should do here because it, we're not dealing with NPPI data. Was there another question? Yeah, yeah, it's just analytical doesn't normally use NPPI data. Yeah, I mean, as a company, we're trying to scrub that out as much as possible, to be honest, even in the source systems and yeah. tokenize it. Now, you know, where we get in trouble, well, not in trouble, but where it's a problem, right, is the unstructured text fields, right, where anybody can type in anything they want, right? So, you know, if you're a claims agent and somebody's, you know, you decide to type in a social security number in there, that's a problem because uh, it's not supposed to be there. So we do do scans for that type of stuff. We use entity extraction to identify uh, social security numbers and abstract them. Yeah. But that's done pre-process, essentially. So. Uh, before you began speaking today, you said that you're definitely going to the cloud. Yes. Um, so was that just generally speaking, or you have a specific vision, and are you looking at any specific um, you know, options so we are doing that. Yeah, so good question. So we're aggressively moving to the cloud. I mean, we have timelines set up, set out by our senior leadership. We have, um, we have EMR clusters in AWS that we can spin up with all the same security controls that we showed you here. When we're dealing with some of our corporate clients, so like corporate HR, corporate legal, some of these guys, you know, the conversation goes easier when you say, hey, let's land it on our internal data lake and like let's experiment. And then once we get to a solution that they like, then we talk about moving it to S3 or landing on an EMR or HD Insight. Or we're, we're, we're definitely more mature, uh, I'd say, in the AWS space, but we're looking strongly at the Azure side as well. So, so, so like as you, is it that you use the cloud for things that is not CII or is there a particular strategy for what you might do in the cloud versus what you would do? So the end goal is to have it all out there. You know, and, and I think you know, we need to be able to have an environment that uh, that, that is uh, you know, classified, if you will, restrict up to the restricted level. Like, we need to be able to have an environment that we can handle that confidential data. Um, so it's not so much the dichotomy of data. I mean, our, our cloud environments are certified from our security teams up to those levels. It's more of just a comfort. Uh, and honestly, some of the experiments that we run, they're, they're just quicker to, you know, if we're moving four terabytes from a source system to the lake, just to try something and experiment, that's way quicker than moving four terabytes to the cloud. And once we know it works, then we'll figure out the pipeline to get it out to the cloud on a regular basis, right? But for experimentation, it's way faster to do on our premise there. And you so. said you were doing EMR. Uh, we end up time. <laughs> so we got to talk we about well, Yeah. So guys, thanks for joining. And, uh, we could follow up on that question right here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.